Okay, so continuing on with our example from Chapter 5, Heck et al.'s uh, book, um, what we were doing previously was uh, we were looking at um, modeling growth curves for students' test scores. Um, and so basically, kind of looking at our data set again, we had a variable uh, was, which was a, a level 2 identifier. This is the student level, so this is student 1, student 2, student 3, and so forth. Um, we incorporated uh, a time variable, so time zero, time one, two. So this is just the you know these are the values associated with uh, three different measurement occasions for each uh, student. The quad time variable is the square of the time variable, and um, so what we basically did in our previous analysis uh, was uh, when we ran our analysis, we had set it up to where we had uh, a repeated covariance type at level one of a scaled identity matrix. Uh, we had uh, fixed effects for time and quad time, and uh, we had uh, a random component with uh, the linear uh, trend component uh, being uh, fixed. So we, you know, basically what I said in my last video was that, that, you know, if we're modeling a quadratic trend, we can only allow one of the regression coefficients for our, our uh, trend variable to vary uh, across level two units. So we picked uh, the time unit. Or, or the time predictor as um, as randomly varying across the students at level two. Uh, oh, we also had incorporated an unstructured covariance type to account for random uh, slopes for time and random intercepts across uh, the students. So when we ran our analysis, um, what we ended up with was um, you know this model right here. Just kind of as as a recap, what we saw was that uh, the linear trend component uh, for, for the growth curves, that was positive and significant. And then the quadratic component uh, was significant as well, suggesting that, um, that, uh, that the growth curves, um, you know, really a quadratic trend probably is a better fit to the growth curves than just simply a linear trend alone. So um, at any rate, we also saw that the variance estimate at, at level one was statistically significant. Uh, and then we also saw that the slope, uh, the, the intercept, the variance of the intercepts was significant. The variance of the slopes for time was significant. The covariance between the two was, um, was not significant. Now, uh, in this video, we're going to kind of continue on our example by adding in uh, level two predictors of the variation in the slopes for time. Um, now, in, in uh, the presentation uh, by Heck et al., uh, they actually moved from using uh, the time and quad time predictors um, to utilizing, uh, uh, they essentially converted these variables uh, using orthogonal coding into two uncorrelated components. Uh, and the rationale behind it was that um, essentially that time and quad time are likely to be uh, you know, pretty highly related because the quad time variable is just this, is just uh, formed by taking the square of the time variable, and so um, so what that does is it increases the correlation between the two. And so if you want to break out those variables into uh, separate uncorrelated components, uh, you can use an orthogonal coding scheme. So in the data set that we're working from, uh, we uh, you know the the authors had already. Uh, created those variables. They called it orth time and orth quad. And you'll notice the orth time variable um, has codes of negative one, zero, and one, uh, which correspond to uh, time values of zero, one, and two. So this is, this is the uh, value associated with time one, uh, time two, and time three. So you've got the negative one, zero, and one uh, codings. For the orth quad variable, you have values of one, negative two, and one, which correspond to these values on the original um, um, quadratic term. So that's all that that's that's taken place. Uh, the way this would have been, uh, these variables would have been created. Uh, probably they would have gone into uh, recode into different um, variables, and uh, essentially for the time variable, you know, just to kind of give you a, a quick demonstration. I might call this, you know, the orth time. I'm just going to put a point one there uh, to create a new variable in the data set just to illustrate this. Uh, under old and new values, we would have said zero, make that um, a negative one. Um, a value of one on the time variable, we're going to make it a zero. And then a value of, um, and then the value of um, 
2, we're going to convert that into a 1. So essentially the 0 uh, is going to be converted to, actually that should have been a 1. Oh, excuse me, a negative 1. I was looking at the thing. So yeah, 0 to negative 1, 1 to, uh, to a 0, and then a 2 to a 1. And so there you go. So we're going to click on that, click on OK. And so when we look at our data set, variable view here. We've got the new orth time variable right here and there's our coding and if you just want to put it next to each other just just for for fun um, you can see we have the exact same value. So that's how that was created and you would just basically use the same recode approach when you are uh, uh, creating the orth quad variable. So at any rate what we're going to do is we'll, we'll first we're going to run our we're going to swap out those uh, variables we're going to take quad, uh, the time and quad time out, put orth time and orth quad in as, um, as predictor variables. And um, also, um, in terms of their uh, presentation, uh, they also in, decided to incorporate um, an unstructured uh, matrix at level two and a diagonal matrix at level one. So. Uh, in order to remain consistent with their presentation, that's what we're going to do. So, uh, in fact, what I need to do is get out of here and re kind of reboot, if you will, mix models linear. And I'm going to convert this to a diagonal matrix. And I'm going to move these guys out and put the uh, orth time and orth quad variables in. Under fix, we're going to move both of these over. Under random, we're going to move uh, orth time variable over, and we're going to leave it as uh, the unstructured right here. So uh, there you go. So um, at any rate, that's that's how we're going to do it. And so um, we'll click on uh, continue and on OK. So uh, at this point, uh, what we'll see in our output is we'll see, uh, you know, once again, we'll have the orth time variable, orth quad. You know, both of those were statistically significant. Um, and when we look at the uh, estimates of the covariance parameters, now you'll notice because we asked for a diagonal matrix, we now have a variance estimate for the errors at each level or each time point. So this is time one, time two, time three, residual errors. All three were statistically significant. You'll notice that uh, the um, the, the slope for uh, each person's intercept, the variance is statistically significant. Uh, excuse me, the intercept is statistically significant in terms of its variance. The uh, variance of the slopes um, is statistically significant. Then we also ended up having uh, statistically uh, significant covariance uh, between the intercepts and the slopes. So there's the covariance and, and it's significant. Um, because of the orthogonal coding uh, that we utilized, um, you know, the, the intercepts for each individual is basically going to be each person's grand mean uh, across time. And so the intercept parameter right here uh, is essentially going to be the average of each person's grand mean. So uh, that's, what, what, that's why uh, this value is 52.94. Now, to add in uh, level two uh, predictors, um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go to uh, analyze mixed model linear and now what we're going to do is we're going to add in a student socioeconomic status uh, and then also a perception of teacher the the effectiveness of their teacher um, so we're going to uh, incorporate uh, this into the model so we're going to click on continue and move SES over to the covariance box and the uh, perceived effectiveness variable over as well under fix, we're going to move SES over, and we're going to move effectiveness over. And um, now, in their, their presentation, uh, they actually go ahead and uh, model a uh, cross-level interaction between the effectiveness and SES variables and um, and the orth time variable. So, um, you know, we we could have just run a, a basic model with just these two variables and then added in, but uh, just in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and model cross-level interactions. So to do this, we're going to click on Build Nested Terms. Uh, we'll click on uh, 
you know, we'll click on uh, the orth time variable since that is the variable that's allowed to randomly vary across um, across groups. We're going to click on that and then buy and then SES. Click add and then we'll do the same for uh, the effectiveness variable. So um, orth time by effective. Click on add and there you go. So now. Um, uh, when we click on continue and then uh, on OK. Okay, so now you'll see we have 13 parameters being estimated. You'll see uh, the random effects uh, in terms of the uh, uh, intercept or time. We're estimating three parameters because we're estimating the slope and the, the variance of the intercept and slope at level two as well as the covariance. So that gives us the three. Um, you also notice that for the repeated uh, effects, now we have three parameters being estimated because we're estimating the variances uh, of the residuals at time one, two, and three. So, you know, if we were using the scaled identity uh, matrix at level one, we'd be estimating one parameter instead of three. So you do need to keep in mind that uh, the, the covariance types that you have have implications for the number of parameters that are being estimated in your model. And, you know, as you estimate more and more parameters, uh, you know, you run into a greater likelihood of, um, of um, estimation problems and, and convergence problems. So we're good in this particular uh, demonstration, but just kind of uh, that's sort of a, you should be kind of forewarned about that particular issue. So um, kind of scrolling down, uh, when we look at our uh, fixed effects, you can see, uh, you know, again, there's the orth time quad variables. Both of those were significant. Uh, SES at level two, predicting the randomly varying um, intercepts, you can see that that's not significant. So SES was unassociated with students' average um, test scores over time. Uh, the effectiveness variable was related. It's actually a positive relationship, uh, suggesting that you know, students who perceive their teachers as more effective also tended to uh, perform better on average over, over time. But then we have the cross-level interactions, and you can see that both of these are statistically significant. Um, the negative coefficient right here actually indicates that, you know, among, you know, if we think about it as, you know, among higher SES uh, students, the, um, the relationship, the, this linear component right here actually uh, decreases. So the slope coefficient, you know, decreases um, as, um, as we um, increase our um, SES. So what that tells us then is that higher SES students exhibited uh, less um, um, linear increase over time than low SES students. So low SES students actually exhibited um, greater rates of change than the higher SES students. For the effectiveness variable, uh, you can see we have a positive coefficient here. Basically, um, teachers that were perceived as, uh, or students who perceived their teachers as um, effective or more effective uh, tended to exhibit a stronger um, relationship um, between the ORTH variable and, um, and test scores. So, it, you know, in a nutshell, you can say that, you know, if we added this coefficient to uh, this coefficient right here, you can see that, you know, more effective teachers would uh, exhibit uh, greater amounts, you know, the students that perceived their teachers as being more effective exhibited uh, more positive rates of change, whereas students who perceived their teachers as less effective uh, demonstrated kind of a weaker um, um, relationship uh, over time or time relationship to uh, test scores. So when we scroll down a little bit further, you'll see our estimates of covariance parameters. You can see there's our variance estimate for uh, the uh, intercept, significant variance estimate for uh, the slope, uh, significant, and then the covariance estimate is also uh, significant. Uh, you can see that again, the uh, residuals at time one, two, and three, their variances are were all statistically significant.